Warning, the following content depicts sometimes violent acts and may be disturbing to some viewers. It also may not be suitable for small children. Police officers ignoring the law they're meant to uphold. Okay, is this officer nine, nine times out of ten wouldn't arrest them. Sometimes lying, sometimes threatening violence. Gonna, as soon as they come off, I'm gonna beat that beat your That's what I'm gonna do. And sometimes striking out brutally. Fracturing the woman's orbital and sinus wall so badly. She underwent reconstructive surgery on her face. And yet somehow not facing prosecution. Not to charge, not to charge, not to charge a San Antonio police officer. And even remaining employed. A veteran San Antonio police officer who was fired has won his job back. It's all part of a growing trend. Hey, that has national experts worried. When a police officer engages in some really heinous behavior, they don't seem to stay fired. It's a KSAT News Defender Special, Broken Blue, Misconduct in the San Antonio Police Department. They are our protectors, our peacekeepers, even our heroes, police officers. It's an important job that requires the character to handle the authority and the power that comes with it, which is why when an officer misbehaves, the case had defenders believe you have the right to know about it. For years, reporters Dylan Collier and Tim Gerber have uncovered case after case of officer misconduct. Tonight, we'll look at some of what they've discovered, but also ask the question, why does there seem to be so much of it in San Antonio? We start with a case of brutal violence. Here's Dylan Collier. And Steve, all she wanted was justice, but this victim also claims once it became clear she was accusing a police officer, the system that was supposed to help her hindered her. When they first met, Krista Cooper nurse says she felt safe. You know, Justin's a big guy as it is, so I think anybody, you're going to feel a little bit more protected. In fact, the man who would become her fiance, Justin Ayers, was also an officer with the San Antonio Police Department, but that was the beginning. This was the end. May 25th, 2018, an off-duty heirs had done some heavy drinking. But that night was, it was beyond his normal. When an argument started at the couple's north side apartment. And then I said, if that's how you feel, then you can leave. But on the way out, Cooper Nurse says it turned violent. He was in a complete rage. As she says, he pushed her onto the front lawn of their complex. I flew like a rag doll. And got on top of her. I remember him hitting me so hard. And even biting her. And he just put two fingers, my two fingers in his mouth and just bit down. And then after that, I kind of just dozed off, blacked out. Ayers was gone when the San Antonio police arrived, but this is what they found. And just listen to their reaction. One officer on scene said it looked like he was trying to kill you. Do you believe he was trying to kill you? Absolutely. But as Cooper Nurse was loaded into the ambulance, she noticed something, a woman police officer riding with her. She wasn't there for company. She was there to detain me. It's like, detain me? For what? Well, it turns out Ayers had already visited a nearby SAPD substation and reported the incident with himself as the victim. In fact, it's the same location where Ayers worked every day, meaning the officers who investigated the scene were his colleagues. But the respondent officer is Officer Justin Ayers. Even months later, Ayers played the victim, claiming that Cooper Nurse attacked him with a rock. <laughs> Here. The problem? This eyewitness account from a neighbor tells a different story, with Ayers attacking Cooper Nurse and kneeing her three times and then holding her down as he punched her face. Once at the hospital, <laughs> doctors discovered the damage was far worse than previously estimated, with her skull fractured in three places, leaving the bone around her eye and sinuses demolished. They said that 
the orbital wall would have to be replaced because at that point my, my eye had nothing to support it and it would ultimately just fall. So doctors performed extensive reconstructive surgery, including inserting a metal plate through her mouth, leaving half her face still numb. And the feeling is still not there. But even worse, she says, first she applied for a protective order against Ayers and was denied. But then Ayers asked for the same order against her and was approved. Next, SAPD decided not to criminally charge their fellow officer, but instead passed the case to the district attorney, labeling it a misdemeanor assault because there had been no permanent serious damage. Is that an insult to you that you know, you, you're going in to have a metal plate put into your head and they're describing this as minor injuries? I wasn't surprised because nothing was really taken for what it should have been. Then had it not been an SAPD officer, the case would have been completely differently. So was I surprised? No. It took three months before the recovering Cooper nurse finally got some good news. A citizens review board had reviewed the incident and recommended that Ayers be fired. SAPD Chief William McManus took action. Just one catch. Despite the orders of the police chief, Ayers had a good chance of keeping his job won by the union, also known as the San Antonio Police Officers Association. It's called arbitration. It's discouraging. It's, you, have these, you have these police officers that feel guarded, and they are safe. They are, so, they are so safe. They're so untouchable. So what happened next? We'll tell you more about that a little later. But first, reporter Tim Gerber will show you a case where an officer was fired twice and both times got his job back. And as soon as they come off, I'm going to beat that beach what to do. You ready? And in a few more minutes, one of the most infamous acts of San Antonio police misconduct. Welcome back to a Defenders One Hour special, Broken Blue, misconduct in the San Antonio Police Department. We just showed you how an off-duty officer beat his fiance, but wasn't charged by police or the district attorney. He had also filed an appeal to get that job back with what's called an arbitrator. Now Tim Gerber shows us more about this process and how it helped another officer accused of misconduct get his job back not just once, Tim, but twice. That's right, Steve. In this case, that officer was on the job when he made an unusual offer to a suspect he had just arrested. It was all caught on camera, and it wasn't the first time he had done it. They're there to serve and protect, you know, not to, you know, do what they want because of the badge. Eloy Leal admits with his long criminal record, he's no angel, but claims when Officer Matthew Belver arrived in his neighborhood one August night to investigate a reported shooting, he was only trying to be helpful. I told the officer that there was still bullet shells behind my brother's truck, and he asked me where, and I pointed there on the ground. And he ended up handcuffed in the backseat of Belver's cruiser. And when the two men started arguing, Belver made a proposal to his suspect. He could fight for his freedom. Let's take the cuffs off. All right? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's take, take them off. off. Let's take the cuffs off. All right? But being you, one-on-one. -on -one. Sure. All right, absolutely. Was it a joke? Apparently not, because the officer starts uncuffing Leal. And as soon as they come off, I'm gonna beat that beach. Uh, what I'm gonna do. Uh, you ready? Yeah, man. Wait, you break my arm? No, that hey. would be the idea. Jesus Christ. That would be the idea. There you go. There you go. Now, you can get out. Let's go. Run. Do something. Suddenly, Leal seems to realize this is very real. Just tell me about the bullets, bro. Okay. That's it, man. Okay. I, I, I didn't mean no disrespect, man. Okay, really. so nothing's gonna come out of this. All right. So the officer cuffs Leal again and places him back in the patrol car, but Belver can't seem to let go that the brawl is canceled. Come on, I had me all bro. excited. I was ready uh, for it. Get back in there. Uh, yeah, hold on. Going to jail. I thought it was going to be a good fight. But nah, you changed your mind. You told me you were. You lied to me. You actually would have gone to let me fight you. Yeah, you kicked my, my gun, shoot me in the head. No, 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 no. Finally, Belver starts driving when Leal has a question. I'll think of something. How about public intoxication, pedestrian in a roadway, uh, whatever else I can think of. And along the way, the officer lets his prisoner know a few things. You're like, hey, cop, can I walk through here? Hey, some investigation you guys did. Who talks to people like that? I would never talk to anybody like that. That's why you're going to jail and I'm not. 
and you had the chance to run, to fight, to do whatever, but you did it. Because not only are you stupid, you're a coward. And on top of it all, it's all because you're a disrespectful, trashy human being. Like, you can look at you and see how trashy you are. There's no doubt that policing is a very tough and stressful job, and occasionally we all have bad days at work. But can that really explain or even excuse Officer Belver's behavior? Meets Carlos Flores. In 2009, Belver pulled him over, cuffed and arrested him on suspicion of DWI. Once again, the officer had a challenge. If you can kick my I will let you go. Flores refused, but later said Belver repeatedly struck him in the head, arms, and back. Despite obvious injuries to Flores' face in his booking photo and other snapshots, Belver told investigators amazingly that he didn't see any injuries. A few days earlier, Belver arrested this man on a disturbance call who claimed the officer removed his handcuffs and told him, let's go, you think you're big hit me. The man reported Belver hit me in the head and face and kicked him repeatedly. The result of those two incidents, Belver was indefinitely suspended from the San Antonio Police Department. In other words, fired. But that wasn't the end of it. Why? The police union agreement with the city gives any officer the right to appeal any termination. It's called arbitration, and both the city and union get to make their case to a single arbitrator, a lawyer with specialized training who's also an expert in that bargaining agreement. So in 2010, Belver appealed his firing, and in the end, the arbitrator reduced the termination to two 30-day suspensions with back pay and benefits, and Belver was returned to the force. Oh, I'm just going to, as soon as they come off, I'm going to beat that beat your I'm going to do. You ready? So when a similar allegation came up six years later for the incident with Leo Leal, once again, the police chief fired Belver. Once again, he appealed. And again, the arbitrator reduced his termination, this time to a 45-day suspension, again with back pay and benefits. It's got to be very demoralizing to those who care about uh, the integrity of their local police force. Norm Stamper is a nationally recognized expert on policing and the former chief of police for Seattle, Washington. He says officers deserve the right to due process and to appeal a firing. If it deserves to be overturned, then overturn it. There are situations where police administrations have made mistakes. Somebody's been terminated wrongfully. They deserve their job back. But Stamper, who advises law enforcement agencies across the country, says he's seeing a troubling trend. When a police officer engages in, for example, excessive force or sexual assault or some really heinous behavior, and the police chief or the sheriff fires that individual, they don't seem to stay fired. In fact, a recent study by the Washington Post backs Stamper up. It looked at major cities where police officers could contest their firings through an arbitration or appeals process. The result, between 2006 to 2017, in Jacksonville, Florida, only 3% of fired officers got reinstated. In Fort Worth, it was 11%. Over in Houston, 22% of fired officers got their jobs back. But further up the list, Oklahoma City had 40% return to duty, Philadelphia 62%, and at the top, San Antonio with 70% of fired police officers getting back on the job by arbitration or appeal. But when I hear arbitrators saying, well, the chief fired you, uh, but I thought that was just too harsh for the offense. So I am going to uh, sanction you to the tune of 45 day suspension or a 60 day suspension. Where is the, is the reasoning in, in that situation? It's just crazy. But there is yet another piece to the puzzle of officer misconduct. When we come back, Dylan Collier looks at an infamous case when an SAPD officer gave a homeless person a sandwich of excrement and how Texas law helps him and others get their firings reversed. And just a little later, the case that defenders investigate an officer with a problem with the truth. Me and this guy, I never arrested for weed, ever. But we're in a camera car and we're doubled up. We're back, and this is a case at Defenders Special on misconduct in the San Antonio Police Department. You just saw how one officer was fired twice for offering suspects he arrested a deal, beat him up in a fight, and they could go free. But both times, he won his job back through what's called an arbitrator. Now Dylan Collier shows you one officer who used what many call a loophole in the law to overturn his dismissal for making a 
particular kind of sandwich. Dylan. You couldn't be blamed for thinking Matthew Luckhurst had a passion about something most people find, well, gross. In fact, this SAPD bike officer practically became famous for it. Here's how the story begins with Officer Matthew Luckhurst on bike patrol with three other officers. Part of their beat, as seen in this exclusive body camera footage, Houston Street and Interstate 35, a regular camping spot used by the homeless. Give me your IDs, you're all violating criminal trespass. Hey, that the officers have to clear regularly. Man, it smells like pee out here. How are you gonna hang out here? And in this same spot, something happened that police officials would later call vile and disgusting. Luckhurst found some dog feces near his foot and using a piece of bread that he also found on the ground, smeared the excrement on it and put it in a discarded food container, which he then set next to a sleeping homeless man. One officer on the scene testified that Luckhurst thought it was, quote, just funny and was, quote, laughing as he described what he'd done. But as word spread, many of his colleagues said they were disappointed and in disbelief. The police chief fired him for the incident and the media covered it near disgusting, unbelievable, disturbing and far. But only a month after the sandwich incident, before it had even come to light, Luckers pulled another prank at the offices of SAPD Bike Patrol, again involving the same topic, so to speak. According to police documents, it happened in the women's bathroom where both Luckhurst and another officer defecated in a toilet and left it. Then they spread a brown substance like tapioca all over the seat. The result, after another internal affairs investigation, Luckhurst was fired again. But Luckhurst had something on his side. It's a law that has helped other officers accused of misconduct. The purpose of it is was to take politics out of the decision making. That's how Mike Helly of the San Antonio Police Officers Association describes the state civil service law. Among other things, it limits how long a city has to discipline a police officer. The limit, six months or 180 days from when any alleged misconduct supposedly happened. And it's also a part of the police union's contract with the city. Helly says it's his job to defend it. And it's basically the process. My only my only goal is to make sure that you guys follow the process when you're going after one of our employees. Hey, where do you usually stay, man? So how did it help Luckhurst? He appealed his termination for the sandwich incident to an arbitrator, claiming that the incident happened more than six months earlier than his firing. The result? He won the appeal, effectively getting his job back. Does it seem right to you that he would win back his job on a technicality? So the answer is Yes, because remember I told you the process we have to defend. Should the department have done things to, to make sure they were there in the guidelines yeah. or the process? Yes, they should have. This is an example of their failure to do that. Now, Luckhurst isn't back on the job yet because he's still appealing his second firing for that other prank we told you about. That will likely go to an arbitrator later this year. Want more on our investigation into police misconduct? You'll find the cases you've seen and much more at our website, ksat.com slash broken blue. When we return, he was accused of tampering with evidence. So, say we found it all in the same spot. That's that. Okay. And later, the police chief and the police union go head to head. Welcome back. So far, you've seen how some police officers have misbehaved but kept their jobs through a combination of strong union agreements, protective state laws, and just law enforcement investigating law enforcement. But now Tim Gerber shows you what happens when the case had defenders get involved. Tim. Steve, they are probably the two most basic requirements for police officers, enforcing the law and telling the truth. But for one San Antonio police officer, it seems that was only a part-time rule. April 7th, 2015, and what appears to be a routine traffic stop for an expired registration. Uh, do me a favor real quick, just put your hands behind your back for a second. Okay, you're not under arrest, I'm just detaining you, okay? Soon becomes something more. That's because earlier, officers Matthew Martin and his partner saw the male driver receive several small packages, possibly drugs. So they do a search of the car. Yeah, I'm gonna have to pull him out and search him a little better, because I asked him three times and he, oh, there it is. They find two baggies of marijuana near the center console. The female passenger at first says she had no idea about the pot, but when Martin radios for a female officer to search her, the woman makes a surprising admission. We, 
probably pull it out for you right now and I'll just get it over with. Nobody has to come. I'm not gonna waste your time no more. It's at this moment that things take a turn. First, Martin mutes his microphone and talks with his partner. Then he comes back with a plan. Okay. See that red flashing light? Okay. Everything's being recorded because we're working narcotic interdiction. Okay. So we're gonna say we found it all in the same spot. That's that. Okay. Martin continues. Green. This is what I'm gonna do, okay? I'm gonna take the cuffs off. Take it out. Okay. After removing the cuffs, he tells her what to do with her marijuana. Face the door, take it out, put it on the seat. The next step, explaining the plan to the driver, now handcuffed in the back of a patrol car. Me and this guy I never arrest for weed, ever. But we're in a camera car and we're doubled up. We're working narcotic interdiction. Okay. So, so, so we let her slide. Because I know she had some on her. All right. So put all these other bags. We gotta take you. So the woman is allowed to drive off, and Martin and his partner take the driver to jail, charging him with possessing all three bags of marijuana. But that wasn't the end of things, because at the Bear County District Attorney's Office, investigators got a look at the video you just saw. Then they called Internal Affairs at SAPD. After interviewing Martin, the department noted that he repeatedly lied about the events of that night. Their decision, Matthew Martin should be fired, and a recommendation went to the DA's office to charge him with tampering with evidence. But guess what? Then acting district attorney Nico LaHood rejected the case because he felt Martin was a good cop who made a bad decision. It was a, it was a decision based off of what I felt at the time was a totality of the circumstances, and I stand by that decision. And when Martin appealed his termination, the arbitrator came to a very similar conclusion saying while Martin lied in his police report on the incident, his actions seemed sympathetic and he didn't personally benefit by letting the passenger go. His decision, Martin should get his job back with a one-year suspension. But police expert Norm Stamper says rulings like these are a lose-lose. And it's just vital that we understand the harm being done every time one of those disciplinary actions is overturned. Stamper says when a questionable officer is returned to the force, it hurts the department's order and discipline and the community's trust. It, it really creates havoc. It uh, reduces uh, consistency and reliability to, to virtually nothing. So now what? Well, it was about this time the defenders got involved after receiving an anonymous letter alleging Matthew Martin made a number of claims during his arbitration, all a part of his argument to win his job back. First, he said that he spent four years honorably serving in the United States Marine Corps, including a tour in Afghanistan. And if that wasn't impressive enough, next, he said he joined the U.S. Secret Service as a highly trained member on the elite presidential protective detail. Martin also said he attended and graduated from The Ohio State University. The only problem? It turns out none of the claims were true. Once again, Officer Matthew Martin had been caught in a lie. The department opened a new internal investigation, and once again, investigators sent new charges over to the district attorney, this time for perjury. But once again, the charges were rejected, and this time, DA Nico LaHood wasn't happy. So ultimately, who, who, who made that decision? There's a top person in our office made that decision, and I'm dealing with that person myself. It turns out Matthew Martin avoided court by agreeing to resign from the force. The, the, the right decision in the end, in my opinion, did not happen. The right decision would have been holding him fully accountable for, for, for lying twice. So what does the San Antonio police chief have to say about what you've seen so far? You'll see in our next segment and also hear more from the police union as Tim Gerber and Dylan call your team up to get the answers. When we come back to Broken Blue, police misconduct in the San Antonio Police Department. And just a little later, a controversial study asks, are unions bad for good policing? Welcome back. In the last half hour, you've seen how even when an officer commits a, quote, disgusting act and is fired, state law and union protections help them keep their job. So what does the San Antonio police chief have to say about this? If the public trust is broken, that's one of the worst things that can happen to a police department. He's Chief William McManus, the head of SAPD. The subject of the conversation, misconduct among his ranks. We have an obligation to the public to make sure that these cases are, are disciplined 
uh, properly. Which makes his admission to reporter Tim Gerber surprising. Are there some officers still wearing a San Antonio police uniform that you think should not be San Antonio police officers? Yes. Does that bother you? Sure, it bothers me. But the chief says there isn't much he can do about it because of protections granted police officers by Texas law and also by San Antonio's agreement with the police officers union. Both let officers appeal any job firings to a single person, an arbitrator. Once an arbitrator rules, you know, that that's water that's long gone under the bridge. But McManus says there are problems with the system. Every officer is due their due process. But again, some of these things that, that are uh, our due process are not quite fair. At the top of McManus's list, that 180 day rule we told you about. It says police management has six months to discipline or fire an officer for misconduct. We got Louis Vuitton wallet, man. As you just saw, the rule allowed an officer to win his job back after being fired for giving a homeless man an excrement sandwich. McManus recalls a similar rule when he worked in the nation's capital. When I was back in D.C., we also had a 180 day rule, but it was 180 days from the time that you were you were aware of the infraction, not 180 days from the time the infraction occurred. If we find something out after the, the 180th day, we can't go back and take corrective action on it per the contract. And I don't think that that's just. The chief also told us that the rules say even when an officer repeatedly commits the same violation, like the case we showed you of Officer Matthew Belver, it often can't factor into deciding his punishment. Why? We can only go back two years and use past discipline as um, uh, as part of what whatever the corrective action might be. So if, if something happened, you know, two years and one day ago and this, the same infraction happened again, we can't refer to that. Uh, we can't use that in, in coming up with a, 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 the discipline or the corrective action that we take. So we wondered, could this help explain why San Antonio is tops in fired officers getting their jobs back, as discovered by The Washington Post? Do you have any idea why you would be higher than, than other police departments similar in size? I do not. But the San Antonio Police Officers Association says it does know why. Association President Mike Kelly told reporter Dylan Collier that the police chief is too quick to fire officers. And he'll cry foul that, hey, you know, I can't fire anybody, but but typically you shouldn't have fired them to begin with. Kelly claims that when police misconduct happens, in some cases, simply firing the officer becomes the easiest political solution for Chief McManus. The chief has routinely made statements in front of the employee and our attorneys that, you know, I, I can't I can't defend this in front of the media or I don't want to defend it in front of the media. So he'll choose to terminate the employee. In fact, Helly points to the case of Officer Tim Garcia. In 2018, his own body worn camera caught him using the N word during an arrest. But instead, the chief fired Garcia, something Helly says McManus often does, knowing it won't stick. And we'll basically say, uh, hey, I'm terminating you and upholding it. Good luck in arbitration. If you get your job back, then we'll come back and revisit it. In fact, one year after being fired, Tim Garcia won his job back via arbitration. But the police chief says the union's claims are, quote, bunk. I would disagree vehemently that uh, I overused the indefinite suspension. And while he wouldn't talk with us about specific misconduct cases, McManus pointed out that terminating an officer is not just his decision. He says before a misconduct case ever gets to him, it is first looked over by an independent review board and... Those indefinite suspensions, for the, for the, for the most part, are recommended by the board. When an officer misbehaves, especially repeatedly, is it your belief that the chief should have the power to terminate that person? Sure, it's afforded in the contract. It is in the full ability to do that. So we had to ask, what about past cases, like Officer Matthew Luckhurst and that uh, special sandwich? That's utterly disgusting. Or Officer Matthew Belver, accused of challenging suspects to fight him. He's now back on the job. And you had the chance to run, to fight, to do whatever, but you did it. 
because not only are you stupid, you're a coward. There's sometimes how they say that bad luck strikes in threes. Sometimes it just happens, and but Matthew um, is a good officer. He, he means well. Um, he just had a stem of bad luck. But where does that leave the public? In the eyes of the community, what do you think that does to the police department? Well, I, I mean, I think it does the same thing as it does to the administration here. I deem it unfair. If an officer is, is terminated for just cause and they're giving their jobs back, then uh, I think the community has a right to, to, uh, to be shocked by it. Coming up, a case that shows sometimes winning has a downside. In just a moment, what is the rubber gun squad? Welcome back to Broken Blue. Perhaps no single case demonstrates the power of the San Antonio Police Officers Association, frequently referred to as the union, than our next one. A mix of on-duty drinking, car chases, and fatal gunfire. But as Dylan Collier shows us, sometimes even when you supposedly win, everyone can lose. Steve, his star was rising fast in the police force. That is until one summer night that ended with a woman wounded and a man dead. But many say that evening, Officer Michael Garza was a hero. You decide. In the early morning hours of July 27, 2012, the paths of Alfred Aragon, Abigail Hernandez, and San Antonio police officer Michael Garza would cross and forever intertwine. Garza was a 10-year veteran of the force, hailed by other officers for his ability to work cases undercover for the department's gang unit. Garza had never been suspended and had only received the weakest form of discipline. Hernandez was his former roommate, and according to records, an off and on love interest. Aragon, the father of her child, and based on text messages that evening, was no longer in the picture romantically. Garza had started his overnight shift working surveillance when he agreed to pick up Hernandez from her far west side apartment and drive her to the Thirsty Horse Saloon on Northwest Military Highway, all while on the clock for the city. As night turned to morning, Aragon repeatedly called Hernandez and sent her texts that appeared to get more desperate and then angry. Aragon forwarded private images of Hernandez he had on his phone. Despite pleas from Hernandez, he would not relent. Meanwhile, in a separate text conversation playing out at the same time, Hernandez arranged to have Garza pick her up at the bar and drive her home. When they arrived at the complex in the 8200 block of Micron Drive, Hernandez spotted Aragon's vehicle backed into a parking spot. Aragon accused of walking up to Garza's truck, opening the passenger side door and yelling at his former girlfriend. Records show Garza drove off and after Aragon sped past them outside the complex, Garza returned Hernandez to her apartment. It would be a fateful decision, as Aragon also came back, this time pulling out a 9mm handgun, and after several apparent misfires, calling Hernandez, who put him on speakerphone in time for Garza to hear him say, quote, everybody's going to die tonight. This time, the weapon did fire, as bullets struck Garza's department-issued truck several times as the officer waited for an exit gate to open. As Garza drove off, Aragon pulled alongside, firing again, this time striking Hernandez twice in the right wrist and stomach. Garza's work truck pierced by bullets 12 times before the confrontation had ended. With his passenger bleeding profusely, records show Garza engaged in a cat and mouse routine with Aragon with each man appearing to pursue the other's vehicle at times before ending up on Aragon Street. After Aragon ran behind a tree, Garza, for the first time, identified himself as an officer and fired his own gun at him eight times. As Aragon moved towards his front door, Garza moved in as well, firing one more shot as Aragon crouched down. Suffering from several gunshot wounds, he died in front of the doorway of his own home while his children were inside. Hernandez survived, and Garza, although uninjured in the shooting, tested positive for alcohol. A supervisor later claiming Garza had been cleared to drink on the job if it helped him maintain his cover as an undercover officer. After a lengthy internal affairs investigation, Garza received an indefinite suspension. The decisions he made changed 
a lot of people's lives. But the family of Alfred Aragon would not have justice in their corner for very long. Garza was cleared of criminal wrongdoing. And then after four days of hearings here at Public Safety Headquarters, an arbitrator in 2015 gave him his job back. In a scathing ruling handed down in June 2015, the arbitrator said Hernandez, used by the city as a fact witness, had given inconsistent and false statements calling it, quote, disturbing that the city admitted Hernandez had deleted some of her text messages, while at the same time refusing to acknowledge their investigation was incomplete. Garza's firing shortened to a 15-day suspension, a decision that prompted then city manager Cheryl Scully to say, quote, I am appalled that an arbitrator has given Michael Garza, who was fired by Chief McManus in 2012, his job back. Officer Garza was drinking while on duty, was not truthful, and did not follow departmental rules the evening he shot and killed someone. So the police took Garza back to the tune of $72,333 per year, including benefits. But they keep him and many of the officers arbitration forces them to rehire on what many call the rubber gun squad. Out of sight from the public, sitting behind a desk without a department firearm or vehicle. So Garza won, but did he really? SAPD declined to let us interview him for this story. In a few minutes on Broken Blue, we return to the story of Krista Cooper Nurse beaten by her fiance, an SAPD officer. But first, we go to Chicago for a study about police behavior and unions. This is Broken Blue, KSAT's investigative look into police misconduct. So far, you've seen how state civil service law and San Antonio's agreement with the police union have affected, some say weakened, the ability to discipline an officer accused of misconduct. But how did things get this way? Here's Dylan Collier. Steve, the answer is it took decades. Where other unions across the country have weakened, police unions have grown stronger and stronger, sometimes foregoing salary increases for more political leverage and protections for their members. But now activists, academics, and everyday citizens have taken notice. It's another day, another traffic stop, but it doesn't take long. Can I take a seat back in the car, please? For this one to go very wrong. Stop resisting right now. Get out of the car. I'm getting out. Let me get out. Do not touch me. Do not touch me. Get out of the car now. Oh, my God. Put your hands behind your back. Oh, my God. Put your hands behind your back. You're under my whip. I'm about to tell you. Please me out. Are you kidding me? So at this point, you may be wondering, what happened to the officer you've been watching? Was he disciplined? The answer is no. That's because this 2015 incident wasn't discovered until a year after it happened, well past that 180-day limit we told you about to discipline officers. The same limit that helped San Antonio officer Matthew Luckhurst keep his job after giving an excrement sandwich to a homeless man. But there's a big difference. In this case, I'm not trying to stand up. It happened in Austin, Texas, with an Austin PD officer. And activists there and city officials began pressing to change not only the 180-day rule, but the city's entire police union contract. And it turns out it's all part of a growing trend nationwide. There's no reason we should be saddled with these kinds of policies. Former Seattle yeah, police that. chief and national expert Norm Stamper says other communities have come to similar conclusions that aspects of their police union agreements are so protective they actually block reform. It has become a national problem. The police in America belong to the people, not the other way around. And it's drawn the attention of academics, too. Take this study of police union contracts from the 2017 Duke Law Journal. It collected and analyzed 178 police union contracts from across the country. The conclusion that procedures often established through the collective bargaining process can serve as barriers to officer accountability. In particular, it identified seven provisions found in many union contracts that could be problematic when it comes to discipline including limiting civilian oversight, limiting consideration of an officer's history, 
and having a statute of limitations for an officer's misconduct, like the 180-day rule, something San Antonio's police chief told the defenders he'd like to see changed. If something comes to our attention after the 180th day, there's nothing we can do about it. Absolutely nothing we can do about it from a disciplinary standpoint. In fact, the study found that San Antonio's police union agreement has almost all of those provisions and includes two that may surprise you. I don't have an issue with that necessarily. What's he talking about? When an SAPD officer is accused of misconduct, the current police union contract requires that before an interrogation, internal affairs notify the officer, tell him what the allegation is and who made it. And then, before doing the interview, wait two days. And one other thing, before the meeting, the officer can view all evidence against him. McManus doesn't see it as a problem. I don't have really have much of an issue with the 48 hours. They have a, a right to due process, and that's part of the due process, which is uh, being able to review the charges that are being made against them. The union agrees with him. You're not trying to have an I got you moment with anybody, right? So you're giving the employee notice that he's under, he's under uh, uh, investigation for whatever it might be, and then he's going to have to come in within that time period after the 48 hours. The circumstance, nothing's going to change within that time. So that thought that, oh, they're going to have time to get their story straight. I, I can't stop that from people saying those things, right? And they can think the way that they want to, but I can't say it's never, ever happened, but the likelihood of it happening is, is, is far-fetched. To put it bluntly, many others disagree. Take this May 2019 study published in the George Washington Law Review called Interrogating Police Officers. Besides examining legal and labor issues, the authors also surveyed 156 police leaders across the country about how such limitations would affect their ability to find the truth when interrogating not police officers, but members of the public. The result? 91% said delaying an interrogation would frequently burden the investigation, and 83% said providing access to evidence would have the same effect. The study's overall conclusion, when it comes to interrogating police officers, delays and other such protections for internal investigations. And that may have a very public cost. If the punishment goes down, you expect the, the misconduct to go up. John Rappaport, an we assistant professor of law, really... is part of a team at the University of Chicago Law School that studied the impact of labor unions on law enforcement misconduct. The conclusion of their research, alarming. The group looked at 20 years of law enforcement misconduct violations in Florida. Why there? Because until 2003 and this state Supreme Court ruling, deputies couldn't unionize. The University of Chicago team found in the years after the ruling, violent incidents among sheriff's offices in Florida increased 40 percent. Just the collective bargaining rights themselves uh, uh, caused an effect on the incidents of violent misconduct. Um, even separate from th the decision to actually unionize. But then, of course, at once we find that it, it does go up, uh, the next question is why. Rappaport says the reason could very well be procedural protections. Basically make it harder for law enforcement agencies to, to discipline or to get rid of officers who are causing a lot of problems. In a few moments, we'll be back with our conclusion. In the last hour, you've seen San Antonio police officers commit acts of misconduct. Yeah, man. Will you break my arm? That would be the idea. Jesus Christ. Including violence that sometimes turned deadly. In other cases, the problems involved honesty. We let her slide. So I don't know if she had some on her. All right. Yes, sir. So put all these other bags. We gotta take it. Or in one instance, humanity. One officer on the scene testified that Luckhurst thought it was, quote, just funny and was, quote, laughing as he described what he'd done. And often managing to keep their jobs, at least initially. And you've seen the police chief. Does that bother you? Sure. And the local police association. My only goal is to make sure that you guys follow the process. Oppose and defend some of the union protections that made it possible. As others worry, where it's all going. And so, yeah, if the punishment goes down, you expect the, the misconduct to go up. 
which brings us back to where we first started. He was in a complete rage. The case of SAPD officer Justin Ayers, accused of beating his fiance on their front lawn. I remember him hitting me so hard. She needed reconstructive surgery. They said that the orbital wall would have to be replaced because at that point my, my eye had nothing to support it and it would ultimately just fall. And while Ayers was not charged by the police or a grand jury, the police chief fired him. Ayers appealed it, like the other officers you've seen, through an arbitration hearing. So what happened? On November 15, 2019, the independent arbitrator upheld determination, and Ayers stayed fired. I had to go through so much, not only physically, but mentally. And his former fiance says it was as if the world made a little more sense. Maybe I was naive to, to go at it as strong as I did. Maybe I just, I don't know why I, I wanted so badly to see justice. Want more on our investigation into police misconduct? Well, you will find everything you've seen and much more at ksat.com slash broken blue. For the defenders and all of us at KSAT 12, thank you for spending your time with us. I'm Steve Spreester. The Night Beat is next.